Welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see some new faces. Um, I always forget to introduce myself, so I apologize for that. Some of you know who I am. I'm Joshua Berg, and I am the sabbatical minister who will be here through May while uh, Reverend Matthew is on sabbatical. If we haven't met yet, please, I'd love to meet everybody. Um, so to begin this worship today, I wanted to talk just briefly about myself. I'm, I was born Jewish, I'm culturally Jewish, and I also identify as a humanist, and therefore, consequently, an atheist. Um, and I am a minister, obviously, motivated by, inspired by, and also critical of both theological, religious, and also positivist and empiricist philosophies. So I'm all over the place. And finally, though, I am dedicated to our Unitarian Universalist faith. And if I read a character like me in a book, I would just, even a few years ago, I'd probably think, yeah, right. No, it's, this author is getting too creative. <laughs> yet, yet here I stand. So I'd like to explore with you today a little bit about the journey that liberated my spirit, so to speak. A journey which I think many of you will relate, hopefully, um, and I'll start by offering a question, and as I do each time I preach, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but it, my question when I, when I call uh, the service, um, I can't speak, I always ask the same question. I word it the same way, and it begins with the words that represent my desire to continue liberating my spirit. It is, let us worship together this morning calling upon the sacred and the spiritual in the question dot, dot, dot. That's what I always say. And this morning, the question is, how might spirit, oh, slide's gone, how might spirit be liberated by using our power to create change? So welcome, let us worship together. Good morning. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from um, Brian Kiley. In times of darkness, we stumble toward the tiny flame. In times of cold, we seek the warming fire. In times of repression, we reach for the lamp of truth. And in times of loss, we pray for the comforting light. In times of joy, we light a candle of celebration. Spirit of life, as we kindle this light, help us find what we need this day. Please join me in reciting our covenant in English and in Spanish. Love is the doctrine of this church the quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship, thus do we covenant. La doctrina de esta iglesia es el amor. La búsqueda de la verdad es su sacramento. Y el servicio es su oración. Vivir juntos en paz, buscar el conocimiento en libertad, servir a la humanidad en comunión, este es nuestro pacto. Our opening hymn is number 1067. Mother Earth, we love it, garden, living treasure underfoot. All our days you ground our being, sage and thistle, grass and root. Herbs to heal us, plants to feed us, land to till and tent and plow. With the pendant deep as midnight north, we ask you be here now. Father, ere your inspiration holds together all that lives, 
As we breathe, our minds say clearly, leading us to love and give. Raging whirlwind, whispered breezes, violent gale and gentle cloud. With the blade as sharp as morning east, we ask you be here now. Brother Fire, great transformer, share the passion of the sun. In our hearths your warmth revives us, cleanse our food and heats our homes. Flaming candle blood within us, blazing desert will to grow. With the one directing power south, we ask you be here now. Sister water ever flowing, ocean, river, pond, and rain. Drink we now and quench our thirsting, cleanse us as we begin again. Mist and ice, a host of changes, all that courage will allow. With the cup, the holy chalice, west we live, be here now. Love or spirit, intuition in the center of our souls. In your love we find relation, all connected we are whole. Timeless mystery, quiet conscience, deepest values, voice inside. With the drum and with the cauldron, this we ask you be our guide. We got through that. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm Linda Fitzgerald, your worship associate this morning. I'm so happy to welcome you here in person and virtually today. For 65 years, Emerson has been a beacon of liberal religion in the West Valley West San Fernando Valley. We acknowledge we are located on the land of Chumash, Tongva, and Keech, people's land which remains part of their lasting identity and heritage. Our existence as a spiritual community can never fully be understood without appreciating the depth of the loss of their land in generations past and the enduring hopes for the renewed vitality of these cultures in years to come. Emerson is a welcoming congregation and sanctuary of love. We are happy that you're joining us today, whether this is your first time or if you've been here many times. Know that you're welcome here. It's good to be back worshiping in person here in the sanctuary. Do you think this is a new beginning? Yesterday, I attended an event with people who were not masked. It felt strange to look at lipstick and mustaches <laughs> and to hear conversations that weren't muffled. This is the first time I've been with people who were unmasked. It was wonderful. Now I'm willing to wear a mask indoors and with the choir when we're singing, but I gotta tell you, yesterday was great. And sitting outside in the sun without a mask, having in-person conversations with friends felt like a real celebration. Even though our in-person times together may be paused by various strains <clears throat> of the virus, we have lived with for so long we keep saying it's two years, but I know it's longer than that. We accept the things that we cannot change and know that we will always be connected virtually, if not in person. No matter what, it's good to be together, however that happens. I'm pleased to be serving this morning with our sabbatical minister, Joshua Berg. He has really hit the ground running here at Emerson, and it's nice to experience his ways of being our minister while Reverend Matthew is away for the next four months. Um, we have Joshua here with us until May, so hopefully you'll reach out and get to know him. Joshua is offering the second sermon in his Serenity Prayer series today. This prayer is part of a miracle that saved my life 
and set me on a road to recovery in a 12-step program in 1976. This prayer was a mantra for this woman who was self-will run riot. <laughs> Defining and accepting the things I could not change turned out to be a way of living that provided untold adventures and happiness I never could have dreamed of. If you are new or visiting here this morning via Zoom, welcome. Please sign the virtual guest book in the chat area. We're glad you found us. And please stay online after the service for our virtual congregational meeting that will tell you so much about our church and how we operate. It is the business of running our spiritual home and all are welcome to attend. The pandemic has changed the way we gather and how we define gathering. But even with our uncertainty of what gathering looks like, it is good to be here with you. Welcome. Boy, I'm still up. <laughs> okay, we have a reading, beautiful reading. Oh, is it the story for all ages now? Oh, maybe it is. <laughs> we'll tag, tag off. Um, yeah, thank you for um, participating in that hymn. It's not one we usually do, but I guess uh, my way is going to be shake things up a little bit. So introduce slowly new hymns, and by May you'll be like, what is that music? You'll wait, wait and see. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's, a light, it's a nice one, so maybe we can include it in our repertoire. Um, I'm going to do a brief story for all ages, for anyone, uh, any youth who are joining us, but also for everybody. Uh, I think this story is one we can relate to. It's called Cleaning Our Clothes Closets. Say that ten times fast. By Martha Dallas. So clothing hanging in a closet, you know, who here has to go through their clothes sometimes, say, every, every year or so um, or more? And um, maybe if you're a kid, it's something your parents make you do and clean out your closet. So I'm wondering, how do you decide what to keep and what to get, get rid of? Um, maybe by, by its fit, is it worn out, is it ratty, are the styles changed, perhaps you never wore it anyway. These are all reasons to decide what to get rid of out of your clothes closet. So what's left in the closet when you're done? Are they older things? Are they newer things? Are they both? You know, and what new things do you put in that closet? So switching gears for a moment. Does anyone know how long this church has been around? When the church started, does anyone know? 56? So quite a while, quite a while. And it was at the Onion Building, right? Beforehand? No, no, it wasn't. It was a lot of places. It was a lot of places. 1956. Anyways, think about what those people had in their closets. Were their clothes similar to ours? I may dress like I'm in the 1950s, but many people are dressing more modern and more different um, than we do today. And those people, too, came to this church on Sundays, wherever it was located. They heard sermons. They prayed prayers. And they read readings. They sang hymns. I don't know if they sang that one, but maybe they did. And they taught children <laughs> what they felt was important. She's saying, no, they, they didn't sing that hymn. <laughs> I liked it. I don't. Anyway, the things they believed, their religious ideas, are kind of like the clothes in our closets. Like, with our clothes, we need to look at our beliefs um, every so often and ask ourselves if they still fit. Perhaps they're too worn out to wear in public anymore. Maybe there's something we borrowed from someone else that we never really used anyways or that we shouldn't have borrowed. We want our beliefs to reflect who we really are on the inside. So we keep the ones that still fit, that still work, and still have meaning for us when we wear them. And like our clothes, we want our beliefs to change a little with us as we grow and as we change so that they always remain true to who we are. And now the affirmation. Mm -hmm. I have it here. I, I do. 
too. I, I, I really think I have it here, but it's written down anyway. Here it is. This is a beautiful reading by William F. Schultz, who is the executive director of Amnesty International USA. It's called Catching Our Breath. When I was a high, in high school, I ran track for a season or two to meet my athletic obligation. Whereas the coach and all the stars of the team would wax poetic about the thrill of the run, what I liked best about running was that once you were finished, you had to take at least 10 minutes to catch your breath. During those 10 minutes, life seemed most worth living. I was most swept up, swept up in gratitude. Spirituality is not unlike catching your breath and being immensely grateful for it. Indeed, in Hebrew, the word spirit originally meant breath or wind. I want what, that which I love to live forever, and so I am forever tempted to be a runner for li from life's uncertainties, to bury my head in the distractions of the everyday. But occasionally I stop running and catch my breath, or perhaps it is my breath that catches me. Occasionally the splendor of the world, someone, something, intrudes itself into my life in such a way that I cannot help but notice occasionally the glory of the stars when the glory of the stars explodes before me so that I cannot turn away. Whatever discloses that abundance, whatever reminds us of the best we can be, whatever summons us to transform the world into ever wider channels of justice and love, this is spirituality. The best way to experience it, I suspect, is to pause and ponder silence. For in silence, we can feel our breath return. And occasionally, if we are very, very quiet, the wind itself may speak. The offering words for this morning are adapted from Kristen Collins. We give to remind ourselves how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that we are part of something bigger than ourselves and to remember those who have gone before us. We give because we believe in music and memory and sacred space. We give with the faith that together we have enough. We will now receive an offering for the support of this religious community and its work in the world. Your generosity is greatly appreciated. You have options for giving your gifts of offering through the app posted in the chat if you are joining us virtually. Donating at emersonuuc.org or mailing a check to the church office. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. 
Thank you all for your generosity. We switched the order up uh, a little bit. I saw the tech people pulling their hair out. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is, uh, before I do the joys and sorrows uh, meditation, we're going to do the meditative hymn. Is that all right? It's a new one, too, so brace yourself. <laughs> Maybe. Spirit of truth, of life, of power is what it's called, and it's a number 403, so it's in the larger book, the, the hardcover book. But the words are very simple, and they should be up on the screen. Can we, can we do that? Yeah, that's all the words right there. Spirit of truth, of life, of power, we bring ourselves as gifts to Thee. Oh, bind our hearts this sacred hour in faith and hope and charity. Oh, that one was pretty, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. I like that one. So um, I'm going to take a moment one of the reasons that we need this community is because together in community, whether you're online, whether you're on person, we can be vulnerable with each other. We can support and validate each other. And that's why right now we are able to share with each other our more intimate joys and concerns and hold each other in love. And this is the time actually when we share joys and concerns. I don't know if there's any in the book over there We'll go check. But I did want to say that right now we are very concerned with, with what's happening in the world, as many of us are, certainly in Ukraine, in Somalia, in Syria, wherever war is. Um, and so I, I would love for us to hold in our hearts and our prayers all of those who are suffering um, because of war right now. And if you'll join me, um, this is something that I think needs a little bit more processing, and some people I've talked to said have agreed. So tomorrow, Monday night at 7, um, if you come on to the link again, the live.emersonuuc.org, um, which I am on here, we will have a vigil, a listening session of Vespers at 7 p.m. tonight. We'll share readings. We'll sh I'm sorry, tomorrow night, tomorrow night. We'll show readings, we're, we'll share music, um, and we'll, we'll share, listen to what's on each other's hearts and minds. So join us, please, tomorrow at 7 if, if you're so inclined. Um, right now I'm going to ring this meditation bowl, and as I do, we can sit together, hold each other in each other's hearts, and if you feel so uh, called, please say out loud, who you have a joy, a joy that you may have, a concern that you have, a name of a person who you're celebrating or who you're praying for, um, and we'll sit for a few minutes together. For all the joys that remain and the concerns that remain unspoken, we offer the love that we have generated here today that will permeate the world. That's what these communities do. They spread love in waves out into the world. So thank you for sitting with us. And now, we, if, if the choir is ready, we can do the anthem. Oh, an intro. I'm sorry. We have an intro to the anthem.
with this uh, anthem that we're going to sing, um, we received uh, performance notes, which um, the writer, Rollo Dilworth, uh, talked about his, an his beautiful anthem. Um, Stand Upon the Rock is a gospel-style song that, like many African-American spirituals, espouses the ideals of freedom, justice, justice, and liberty. The phrase, stand upon the rock, is a saying that encourages us to stand up for what we believe in and stand firmly upon our principles and passions. At its core, this piece is designed to take a stand against those social barriers that divides us, such as hatred, greed, prejudice, and violence. Um, the significance of the phrase, rocks and mountains don't fall on me, basically means that you do not want the universe to give you payback for ignoring the opportunity to stand up for what is right. Such payback might mean that someone may decide not to stand up for you on your behalf when you are most in need of assistance or support.
Thank you so much. Eloise Porter is our choir leader, and you do so much with, they're, they're few in number, but they're powerful and strong in energy. So thank you so much. You are very much appreciated. All right. So as uh, Linda mentioned, today is the second in my talk on the serenity prayer, and I'm going to focus on, therefore, the second phrase, which is the courage to change the things that we can. However, and this month's theme is power, so power requires courage, so it fits together. And as I mentioned in my other sermon, power we must balance with love for po positive change. Now, Reinhold Niebuhr, and that's the theologian who uh, is credited with the Serenity Prayer, writing the Serenity Prayer, and that was changed a little for AA and some other 12-step uh, programs. But his original version was a little bit different. I don't know if anyone know, knows what it was. He wrote, God give us grace, grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about the G word later, but Nibher was petitioning God for courage to change the things, as you heard, not necessarily that can be changed, but that should be changed. Things can be changed for the better or for the worse. So the discernment lies in deciding what changes should be made. And a change, it may be momentary, it may be terminal, um, but I'd like to focus today on change, broadly speaking, greater change, positive, transformative change that is progressive, over time, it's requiring ongoing effort and struggle, thus the courage to change. Brene Brown, some of you may have heard of her, is a researcher, and she showed that all change also includes vulnerability. We have to let go of safety in order to change. We have to take risks. To have the courage, we need to change what we must, what should be changed, Vulnerability is key, or as Brown also names it, she calls vulnerability, and I like this better, loving wholeheartedly, even if it hurts. Now in Western society, vulnerability is often equated with weakness or gullibility or fragility if you're vulnerable, but rather, according to Brown, vulnerability is courage. Brown confirms 11,000 pieces of her data and she said, I cannot find a single example of courage, moral courage, spiritual courage, leadership courage, relational courage, not a single example that was not born completely of vulnerability. It's actually the opposite. When we become less vulnerable, when we lose vulnerability, that we become too fragile, as many in the white and privileged class have become because we're not taking risks we become too fragile. Fragility, it leads to a host of things that define white supremacy culture, actually, uh, that we must let go of in order to love wholeheartedly. Brown lists some. We must let go of our need for perfectionism, this idea that we're powerless, a scarcity mentality, the idea of comparing, and many, many more Brown talks about. But crucially, if we are not vulnerable no enough to experience and overcome adversity by taking the risks and overcoming them, if we are not vulnerable enough to do that, have that experiences, we gradually also lose the ability to find hope that we need to overcome. We're not experienced, so we lose that ability to hope that we need to overcome. Brown writes about it. We have to take down everything we put up that was supposed to be keeping us safe. Allowing vulnerability, it takes courage. And as I mentioned in the question in the subject today, allowing vulnerability liberates the spirit. And as a humanist, my idea of spirit, I acknowledge the collective human spirit, our collective 
energy of life, representing representative meaning that can be found in the world, in our connection to the earth, and in doing good by giving of ourselves. That is spirit. We began this worship with that hymn, Mother Earth, Beloved Garden, with the intention of facilitating this connection to our world and life upon it. And maybe as we practice the hymn more, we'll, we'll get that. that <laughs> you weren't here to hear it, were you? It went well. It was okay. <laughs> um, we'll facilitate, hopefully, the connection to that interconnected spirit of life that we talk about in Unitarian Universalism. That's what we're trying to facilitate with the ritual, with the tradition, with the song. But my mind, personally, is often so entrenched in what I believe to be the truth, so afraid to lose any aspect of myself. I cling too desperately to what I believe is part and parcel to my identity. And this closed-minded desire to resist inevitable change, to resist liberating my spirit, has often stunted my personal growth. Only when I give up that safety in the conviction to be right, when I become vulnerable and I'm willing to be wrong, do I progress. Only then can I sit in that serenity I talked about the other week that is the space between breaths. Only then can I sit in what Dr. Schultz talked about in your reading, in breathing, in spirit that is breath. In Hebrew, by the way, that is ruach. Some of you who are Christians might know the word pneuma, which has the same etymology. It means spirit, it means breath, but I'm on a tangent. Only when I sit in that serenity do, to, it, between breaths necessary to liberate my spirit enough to accept and even welcome the things I cannot change in order to change the things that I should change. Especially as a minister, I often find myself at Dr. Gregory Carroll Boyd talked about this in a sermon right here at Emerson. It was, la was it last week about crossroads. I often find myself in a crossroads. And today, and this is an example, for instance, I am worshiping in what many call a church. Growing up Jewish, even using that word, church, let alone worshiping in one, caused me much tsuris, <laughs> agita, trouble. <laughs> and I don't believe in creationism. Yet my dearly beloved brother, who I respect for his intelligence and discernment, my doctor brother, is an Orthodox Jew who does believe in creationism or intelligent design. I don't say the word God, that was the G word I was referring to, when referring to my own personal theology because it, it, it isn't yet completely meaningful for me. I'm still working on it. Yet in our worship, we routinely use the word God. Um, or similar words, Lord, and we derive from it and ascribe to it new meanings. As a chaplain, and I'm going to be a chaplain at Children's Hospital beginning in August, I must use sacred language, like that word God, and other sacred language, without judgment, without judgment to facilitate healing for others for whom it has very strong meaning. This is the world we live in with others. So at these crossroads that I, I, I find myself, as Dr. Carol Boyd said, I'm presented with a choice of, of paths. Do I choose one I know is comfortable and easy or one I believe is right, one that opens my spirit to growth regardless of being in discomfort? Because discomfort means I'm learning and growing. Since discomfort requires vulnerability, it opens the way for this necessary change, the change we should we be making. Now, let me be clear, discomfort, however, doesn't mean I have to give up my own theology, philosophy, doesn't mean I have to say God, and I may not, with respect to my own theology slash philosophy. I likely won't, but if I remain intransigent as far as understanding, validating, and respecting the use of the word by others, I risk not only misunderstanding and miscommunication, but I risk causing pain. I risk alienating much of the world, and thus preventing change. Because we're not alone. We're not alone in the struggle. And therefore, true transformative change can only happen in community. And I have to transform myself to be in beloved community. I don't have to change my personal beliefs necessarily, but if I don't work to understand connections that others make, 
I put up impenetrable walls, and I become that dogmatic fundamentalist that I condemn. So, with respect and deference to so many who I love and admire, and in the interest of the success of our movement toward positive change, I must open myself to discomfort by listening to and truly hearing others. And with that in mind, I'd like to read a truncated passage um, in which one of our reverends, Reverend Jamie Yandel, they are a, a UU uh, minister, talks about their idea of God. This is what they write. Last Friday night, 600 people from my religious faith watched an online drag show together. It was one of those moments when you realize something epic is happening. I felt joy. The drag show was heaven broken open, given to us for the evening. We were the angels and the kings and queens were our royalty on the stage. Everything for a little while was perfect and I saw the face of my God. Drag is the most authentic thing I can be a part of, watching or taking the stage as a king, they write. Queer people are, in fact, royalty. The early creators utilized drag for survival, and in some cases for protection. When kings and queens are on stage, their witnesses form a holy council. Here is where my God can be found nestled in the crux of the connection of humanity. My God knows I was created for an expansive life and knows that the margins hold the most sacred and holiest parts of humanity. The margins are holy. When I witness a drag show, I'm witnessing my God and all who are present. I can feel our connection. The rhythm of life running through all of us and in all things is so obvious that it almost hurts to feel it so strongly. In that moment, all of the struggles and pain incurred from existing as a person who is non-binary are washed away in that moment, and I am made new again. That's their idea of God. You don't have to agree with it, but it's, it's pretty powerful. And my past self, my Joshua past self, might have listened to that and honed in on three words. They wrote, I was created. I might have honed in on that, ignoring the rest for fear of being in agreement with creationism, which I'm not. But in doing that, I'd have missed that they also wrote, God can be found nestled in the crux of the connection of humanity, a very humanist idea. I would have passed over their description of our connection, the rhythm of life running through all of us and in all things that they wrote. I would have overlooked the fact that they repeated the possessive word, my in front of God, claiming this is their understanding and does not have to be another's understanding. I would have rejected this powerful and meaningful sentiment to which I can relate for an unwillingness to sit in discomfort and thereby stunting my own personal transformation, thereby keeping my spirit captive. Back to the question I asked today was, how might spirit be liberated by using our power to create change? Well, for me, my answer to that, that question is that I can and should be open to changing myself in each moment, all the time. Robin D'Angelo wrote about personal transformation that we need for structural transformation. Personal transformation can be an act of anti-racism, she wrote. But especially for me, a person who is ensconced in the comforts of privilege, as a male, as a white person, as a straight cisgender person, ensconced in the comforts of privilege. And for someone like me who creates intransigent ideas that I to put my mind at ease, personal transformation is necessary so that I can be a part of structural change that we can make in our diverse community of communities, as Paula Cole Jones calls our faith community of communities. If I am to ask others to validate and understand me, what I believe in, mutual, in a mutually respectful relationship, I must make every effort to sincerely do the same. So, once again, to put my actions where my words are, I intend to practice um, now the world that I want to build. 
the world in which no one is coerced to believe something they don't, but everyone respects with deference and works to understand what others believe, recognizing there is no place worth being that I will feel perfectly comfortable and that personal growth only comes with discomfort, I am living into that discomfort as much as I can, even claiming my identity, as I said, as a minister in, in a faith that came from Christianity is doing so, is living into my opening my spirit. And consequently, because I've done it, I've been introduced to Unitarian Universalism, and it has been a most powerfully rewarding experiences and con experience and continues to be rewarding and meaningful for me because I moved into discomfort and vulnerability. And I commit to turning toward the further liberation of my own spirit away from what restricts me. As a humanistic, culturally Jewish person, I admit I also do struggle with meaning making vis-a-vis -vis stories in the Bible. So recently I have been purposefully exploring the story right now of Passover, because that's the season coming up, exploring my own culturally Jewish roots, which I've been able to do more as a Unitarian Universalist than I ever was as a Jew, identified Jew, uh, religiously. And Reverend Rebecca Beezer, our community minister, I don't know if any of you know Reverend Rebecca, but she is our community minister, brilliant woman, she has offered a learning opportunity to me recently to talk about what Lent and Easter could mean to Unitarian Universalists. And I will take Reverend Beezer up on her offer putting it in dialogue with my exploration of Passover, seeing how they overlap, how they're the same, how they're different, meaning how the season of spring, the whole season. And we're going to do it in a small group beginning this coming Wednesday, the 2nd of March, and continuing, continuing every week until the Easter slash Passover Sunday service on April 17th. So I welcome you to come liberate your spirits as well and join us. Um, I will uh, put the link uh, to the registration and here was also in the e-blast. By the way, if you see me looking at my phone, it's because I'm on Zoom. It's not because I'm checking my email or anything. I'm in the service. <laughs> so you can join us. Um, I welcome you. The reg I'll put the registration link in there. I've decided to use, oh, and in conclusion, um, this Serenity Prayer series that I'm doing, I've decided to use it to write my own version of the Serenity Prayer, inspired by Nibers. And I'll replace the word God this time with meaning derived from our own transcendentalist namesake, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote, Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. So my version of the prayer begins, and it's still in draft. May the spirit of the whole of life to which every part and particle is equally related, inspire us with the human grace that allows for transformative experiences of wonder and awe, moments of euphoria where we rest between breaths with complete acceptance of life's challenges, the things we cannot change or know, and recognition that we do not start from a clean slate or a level playing field, allowing us to welcome the elation of each moment, and the potential of the next. May the spirit of the whole of life to which every part and particle is equally related move us to be vulnerable enough to continually balance the exercise of power and love to affect the change that will transform the world for the better. Okay, mine is a little bit wordier, but I can edit it down. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the third part yet, so <laughs> we'll get there. So thank you very much. Um, if you would, please rise in spirit or actually, how was that said? <laughs> actually rise or rise in spirit as you are able. Willie and able, yes. For our closing hymn, um, which you will recognize, number six, we play, uh, two Sundays ago, we were supposed to play this video, and we didn't get to, and we sang a beautiful version in person. So now I promise we are going to play the video just as long as I have breath. Just as long as I have breath. Yes, to truth. 
truth in my dream and in my dark always that elusive spark if they ask what I did well tell them I said yes to truth just as long as my heart beats I must answer yes to love disappointment pierced me through still I kept on loving you if they ask what I did best tell them I said yes to love thank you you may be seated thank you so much so um, the president of our board here at Emerson, I don't know if Clinton's here, I thought I saw him earlier, um, uh, wrote in, uh, in our latest e-blast to do the very thing that I was talking about, to create a better normal, a normal where, as he wrote, we recognize the impacts of our daily choices on others, we honor science, and we celebrate humanity. He asks us to think about our participation in our own community of change. And as the world turns toward war and other unconscionable calamities. It is only through changing the things we should within community, within beloved community, within our community, starting with personal transformation, that we can have any hope of turning back toward peace. We will need our communities more than ever. We have an opportunity to support each other in this hard work. We have a space to be vulnerable together so I encourage you to receive the precious gift that is the community of Emerson by engaging in traditional ways that support us and also in new ways that challenge us. You might start by attending the congregational meeting right after this service at 1145, either in person or on Zoom, and continue by engaging more in ways that you have thought about maybe, you thought about doing but not begun. Begin now. Emerson needs you. We need each other. In Unitarian Universalism, it is each and every one of us who has the power to drive change, if only we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, knowing we have a community of support. Um, and I was going to end there, but I do want to close with a prayer by Reverend Jen Grayson, actually, which I will also read tomorrow night um, in the vigil. It's called A Spirit of Life and Love. A Spirit of Life and Love, our hearts are aching today as we watch fear and terror being inflicted on Ukraine, Somalia, Syria, Afghanistan, long-standing wars and new wars. We pray from afar, seeing people flee in fear, praying in the streets, gripped by an uncertainty that echoes in our hearts. We have known uncertainty and fear these last two years, and while we are aware it is nothing like war, we are reminded of our tie to the humanity of those we have never known. We pray for the parents trying to protect their children. We ache for children as forces outside their control shatter their world. We ache for those doing what they can to flee the movements of nations, and we pray for those who cannot flee. May the world not turn its face away from this pain, even in those moments when we as individuals must rest our spirits. May our thoughts and prayers become actions that end war and the threat of war forever, amen.